Our final speaker on the panel um, is a gentleman I've known for a long time, uh, about the same amount of time as I've known Greg, Bruce Ashby, who is now the managing director of One World. Um, I have, uh, my relationship with Bruce comes from sitting on the other side of a negotiating table from Bruce uh, for, the, for the most part. And Bruce has been at United, at US Airways, and at US Airways he ran um, US Airways Express and so has tremendous insight as to what this sector is. And after leaving, leaving there, uh, left to uh, do a startup in India and, and an airline in Saudi Arabia. And with all of that, Bruce brings tremendous, uh, uh, tremendous experience and an ability to kind of reflect on the global, the global alliance system, how the regional sector plays in that, in that sector, and take it away, Bruce. Thanks, Bill. Um, you know, I work for the One World Alliance now, and um, there are three of us. We're the one with American in it. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with uh, how it works. And, and actually, it's more than that, of course. We have um, 14 members, really two that are members elect and joining. But if you look at kind of our span of the world right now, it's 14 airlines covering uh, huge parts of the world. It took me about three months of constant travel to go visit them all in their offices and, uh, and, and sort of see all the home country places. Um, the job is an interesting one. It's very different than running a small airline or managing a, 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 a regional airline. It's, um, it's one of making sure that the promises made to customers about seamless service and kind of continuity of experience are actually met. So when we say you'll get your frequent flyer miles when you fly on airline XYZ, when you go from Appleton to Beijing, to use the example earlier, that you actually get them and that your bag arrives, and that your airport experience works, and that when you, as it were, you know, leave your normal nest and go out into the world and fly to other continents, that you're treated with recognition and care. And, and a lot of my job is just to make sure those things actually happen, that we deliver what we promise, that we measure what we do, and, and that we're always trying to think of new ways, of course, to make more money and reduce cost, but the, you know, the big part is to make sure we deliver. It's not so different, interestingly, wherever you go in the world, the issues that you face are similar. The issues with the airports, with fees, with taxation, with smart ideas that are there to take your money and give it to someone else, that, that happens everywhere. Um, and, uh, and, and you hear it from all the airlines, and it's a great kind of collage to go look at how they handle it in their different countries. Um, I've learned a lot from that. There are many techniques in the world used to do things that uh, our laws and systems don't allow, but you wish you could get away with them sometimes. <laughs> and, uh, and so here we are today. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here again after many years of being overseas. It's great to be back in the, in the US. I flew PSA yesterday to come down, and uh, it was, it was kind of like coming home again. It was a very nice experience. Right on. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I, I'm going to go ahead and, and throw a few questions out to the panelists. We really want the audience to participate, so please do. And for those of you in the audience who think that we're going to have a conversation on pilot scope clauses, we're not. So if you want to ask a question on pilot scope clauses, you can. Um, but I don't have anything prepared. The first, the first question, I want to go to, back to Mike a little bit. And one of the things that that I'm interested in is how do the low fare carriers and the regional carriers compete in Europe? Um, you touched a bit on the rails. Obviously, the rails and the regional carriers compete. But kind of talk a little bit about the degrees of competition uh, from, from those two areas, if, 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 you, if you might. Yeah, sure. It's an area of increasing concern to all of our members. The initial problem is that they stole the coat. If you see somebody dressed up as a nun, you assume they're a nun. <laughs> so they've called themselves low fare. Absolutely brilliant marketing move because it distinguishes them from everybody else when in practice they are not always the lowest
cost for the passenger. We have seen in the last 10 years a progressive convergence between the traditional uh, legacy carriers, the regional carriers, and the so-called low-fare airlines. You have in additional costs because they don't always fly to the airport that they claim. Uh, Oslo is a classical example. The legacy carriers go into the major city airport and some of the uh, low fare carriers go to an airport more than 100 kilometers away, but it's called Oslo. So there are a lot of additional fees that you pay for a low fare airline. When you put the entire package together, very, very often the legacy carriers are highly competitive. The regional carriers are highly competitive. Where we have a problem is that the, um, thank you, the regulations that exist within ICAO and within the European uh, community regulations are either not applied or there is a, a scope level at which they are not applied. Let me give you an example. There is a requirement within the European legislation for airports to be absolutely transparent on the charges that they offer to any carrier. Now, one of the constant allegations is that low fare airlines get subsidies at airports. The scope on that legislation only kicks in above five million passengers per annum. So if you have a small airport where a regional carrier is operating, let's say, five or six double daily services with a 50-seater, they build up the routes, and then suddenly a low-fare guy comes in and is offered a sweetheart deal by the airport. That's perfectly legitimate because the legislation does not compel the airport to explain all of its charges. So we are now very concerned that the, the subsidies given by airports, whether they are as lower fares, lower charges rather, or as marketing support, taken collectively, are actually now quite a significant distortion in the system. Now we don't want to destroy market freedoms for either the airlines or the airports. They're our partners in this. But we do want to see where decisions are being made that favor one mode or the other. They're actually transparent and justified. Thank, thank you very much. I, I really appreciate you uh, delineating between the regional carrier fare, the low cost or the low fare carrier fare, and the legacy carrier fare, if you will. Mm -hmm. Um, because the same thing is true in the U.S., where there's been tremendous compression in fares, and there really isn't much differentiation. And arguably, the low the low cost carrier is not always the low fare provider in a, in a particular market. And it's a wonderful segue to a question I prepared for Greg. <laughs> Airports strive to attract low fare carriers to their respective communities, and based on lower fares, it makes, or I could say, it made sense, okay? If emplainments were important and driving emplainments 